Good afternoon, everyone. Bonjour à tous, and welcome to Beyond the Concept, Feminist Foreign Policy in Action, and a big greeting to anybody who's watching us online as well. Um, thank you all so much for uh, joining us for this session this afternoon. I'm going to be very brief and turn quickly over to our speakers. I just want to remind everyone the um, session is being recorded, so please, if you are speaking, use the microphones. The button on the right-hand side will turn the microphone off and on, and I would ask that everyone just makes sure that your phones are either off or on silent so we don't have any interruptions during this session. Great. Um, I'm Meredith Preston McGee. I'm the Secretary General for the Global Center for Pluralism and really, really thrilled to be, um, to be moderating this panel. We have six exceptional experts who are going to speak and then an absolute room full of expertise. And so I'm really going to try to ensure that everyone can be as brief and to the point so that we really have an opportunity to be sharing as much from this really incredible um, diverse and experienced room that we have with us today. I'm struck as we think about this concept of uh, of the multi-crisis itself, that one of the things that we're really in danger of losing is progress on important issues like advances in feminist foreign policy. And when we see the opportunities for feminist foreign policy to be genuinely transformative in the way that we operate, particularly given that the usual way of doing business is clearly not generating the kinds of sustainable solutions that we need globally right now. So I can't imagine a topic more timely and more important, not just to think about the concept Concept, but to really drill down to the practical realities and what kind of change we can really make. So I really look forward to us focusing today on the practicalities, what we can be doing, what we can be doing better. And so to really set the stage, I'm first going to turn over to Sofia Shevchuk from Security, who's going to talk us through a little bit of some of the data. I know numbers aren't everything, but they can be a really good springboard for us to look at where we sit right now. Before we turn to a couple specific cases, we'll then turn to a few tools and strategies to kick off some ideas from the entire group. Sofia, over to you. Thank you, Meredith, and I hope you can hear me well. It's a great pleasure being here. Unfortunately, the head of the project of security, which we're representing here, Hannah Neumann, cannot be here today because of family issues, so I'm substituting her. But brace yourself with me. Um, as you already rightly said, feminist foreign policy, at least from the way Sweden sees it, um, who right now, unfortunately, has given up their feminist foreign policy ideas since the last elections. But the way they see it uh, through three R's, representation, rights, and resources, a security project which I represent here today focuses on representation. So the idea with our project is that we focus on women's representation in security and foreign policy, and we are the one project that collected data on women's representation in diplomacy, foreign policy, security, military, police. Um, if you are going to go online and check our results, I mean, they're not very uh, bright and new, so spoiler alert, we do not have enough women there at the tables and in the ministries. Uh, for example, some of the data I can already give you, if we, for instance, look at diplomacy, women in ministries of foreign affairs already take more than 45%, but when we look at ambassadors, there are less than 20% of women. So we can see that at the lower level, women are there, taking administration administration roles, secretary roles, but once we go higher up, there are less and less women. Same data I could see from military police. In the military sector, we have around 10% women across all the countries that we have researched. In police, it's around 20%. So we can see that, yeah, unfortunately, women are not there. And if we talk even about more diversity, people of color, LGBTIQ people, religious diversity, this data is not even there present. So this were one of the findings of the report. And as of this year, we also provide some recommendations. So we're not only blaming and shaming, even though that also works because a lot of newspapers took out our data, started publishing it in the national news, and now the governments are reaching out to us asking what can we do better? How can we improve the data? We didn't even know that we have no women at our administration, so I don't know how and who is doing the work out there. 
but we provide some recommendations in terms of how to collect data, creating sort of a standardized procedures on data collection, publish the data online, because we as citizens have the right to know this data, and once the fastest we know that women are not there, the fastest we can provide solutions to bring the women there. And um, also this year, so as you rightly mentioned, representation is not enough. So we try to provide some qualitative research in terms of, okay, women are there, but are they really included? Are they sitting at the table? What do we need to change? Should we improve maternity leaves cover? Should we impose some quotas? And all of this is present in the report. So if you're interested to know more, please come to us. We have a boost down to, to talk and then read, of course, the report. Over to you, Meredith. Thanks, Sophia. What number is your booth? Good question. Yeah. 40, 46. Excellent. Thanks. I'm sure we'll all be down there um, afterwards to, to collect the report. I wanted to now just turn, because I think it really helps us to think about what is actually happening in different, in different places. Um, and so I want to hand over, Ambika, to you um, to talk a little bit about India. Conscious India doesn't have a feminist foreign policy, but also we have to look at places where we have gender dimensions already within policies themselves and see what we might be able to learn from that. So I will hand over to you. Thank you, Meredith, and thank you to uh, everybody for being here. Uh, I think we needed a bigger room, which is always a good sign. Um, so my name is Ambika Vishwanath, and I'm the co-founder and director of Cooper9 Initiative. Uh, I, Cooper9 Initiative is a female-founded and female-run think tank in India, and it's not a lot of those in my country, but there's not a lot of those in the world either. Um, so we need more women to occupy those spaces. I work a lot on foreign and security policy and looking at the feminist foreign policy conversation from an Indian perspective is what we have been doing for the last three years now. So what is the feminist foreign policy conversation globally? Decoding that for an Indian audience because that question is now arising as to what that means. And what is happening in India then? And what can India offer the global conversation? Because one of our main points here is that you can't have a truly inclusive feminist foreign policy conversation if it's only happening in a small part of the world. And so that conversation needs to be much wider and it needs to break open, which from the time we started doing this research in India to now I can say that it has broken open, but it's still very small. Um, there's not a lot of this conversation happening anywhere in Asia, for example. And so we, three years ago, began this conversation in India and mainstreamed the concept of what is gender, what is an inclusive foreign policy or feminist foreign policy within Indian foreign policy making ecosystem. And by that I mean looking, bringing together people who work on very core areas of foreign policy, what is considered very hard security spaces, but also other spaces of foreign policy making, which to me are a lot more important, such as climate, or if we look at what transboundary water security, humanitarian assistance, food security, energy, and uh, bringing them together along with people who make policy, along also bringing to the room then the gender experts. And so that's the kind of conversation we have started in India. And, and to say that it's been very promising is, is, uh, is a good thing. Um, there are a lot more people interested in this conversation than we imagined to begin with, which is always good to, to be surprised, pleasantly so. Along with trying to decode the FFP conversation for an Indian audience, what we also did was try and understand what is the extent of gender mainstreaming in India's foreign policy? Was it, was it there at all? Uh, and to what extent and in what spaces? And again, we were happily surprised and happy to admit that we were surprised that there is quite a bit of gender mainstreaming in some areas of India's foreign policy. We looked at it from a numbers perspective, of course, but we also looked at it from a policy-making perspective. And we found that there's quite a bit in, in some of our development assistance policies. So when um, our development assistance policies in Africa, for example, when we look at the education space, when we look at women's empowerment schemes, when we look at sanitation, health. So those spaces already had a fair amount of a gender lens incorporated in the policies. 
the other area that uh, was good was climate. So if we look at like the International Solar Al Alliance that was spearheaded by India, um, France, and several other countries. And now we have, uh, I think, almost 100 countries are part of the alliance, if not more. There's a very strong gender component in that, in the Solar Alliance. In our multilateral fora discussions as well, so for example, BRICS, there's a whole uh, gender angle there as well. Now, granted, a lot of this, I think, was very reactive from the Indian foreign policy perspective. Um, it's uh, uh, reactive to events, it's reactive to partners, it's reactive to, to t changing times. Um, it also lies a lot of times with the person who's occupying that office. And that is something now we are trying to argue to say that it shouldn't rest only with the person, um, but it should be with the office itself. So how can we take the learnings of what we have done in India over the last 30, 40 years, uh, and sort of institutionalize that, create certain tools that will then be able to sort of take that into other areas where this consideration doesn't exist at all, but also scale it up as to where it exists already. What can we learn from them for an Indian context, but also for other countries? And I think this is where it's important because there are a lot of countries that might want to embark on this path. They might not say feminist foreign policy or inclusive foreign policy or gender mainstreaming in foreign policy, but they do want to do this work. So what are the examples then that we can provide to these countries that want to do this but not are not really sure where to begin or how to sort of structure what they might have in, in little bits and pieces. And, and so we are trying to create a toolkit now that may be useful for other countries but organizations also that are working with their respective countries. And I think that uh, becomes important because oftentimes we look at countries that are very different in experience, in history, in the socioeconomic makeup, in the ethnic makeup, and they are not easy to aspire. I mean, you can aspire to them, but uh, they are not always easy to follow. Uh, and so then perhaps India's example becomes a little bit easier for a certain set of countries around the world around the world where Canada or Germany might be an example for other set of countries. And so it's also then important what we are trying to tell partners around the world is that the conversation within these countries needs to include a lot of the countries that don't have a feminist foreign policy but have enough evidence of that already in their foreign policy making so that your foreign policy then is that much more stronger going forward. And um, so we have also a booth downstairs. Again, I do not know the number. Um, I realize I should have uh, fixed, figured out the number of this booth, but we are right next to Sophia's uh, security booth. Uh, so, and uh, next to the Global Partner Network booth. So we're all together, so easy to find us in that sense. And we have a few reports that we have looked at what's happening in India. So very concrete examples are in our reports and uh, happy to share that when you all come to visit us downstairs. Thank you. I'll stop now and any questions later would be great. Thanks, Ambika. A couple of things that you that you mentioned about um, sort of the need to almost depoliticize the issue and have it be systematized throughout so that you're not focusing on a particular leader's championing of it. And I imagine that the Swedes in the room might feel that that's particularly something um, of importance at, at, at this moment when we're seeing those changes. Um, you also talked quite a bit about um, the health sector and, and education and so forth. And um, I want to turn now to maybe thinking about what we might think about as hard security. I'm always a little bit um, loathe to use those sort of binary definitions, but to think about the situation in Ukraine and to ask Natalia um, to speak a little bit about how you see women's leadership right now as we talk about war and as we talk about these, these really hard-edged elements of the conflict, where, where can we be engaging around women's leadership, of course, in Ukraine um, for this, but also for those of us from countries who are supporting um, these efforts in our own feminist foreign policies, what do we need to be doing better with Ukraine? Thank you. Thank you. Well, um, 
I'm, I'm actually, you know, listening to you and I'm thinking that I'm wearing, you know, several hats here. So, uh, well, I can speak from, from my experience of being a, an IDP, internally displaced person. Uh, this is a new experience for me, which started on February 24th this year. I can also speak about the, the my organization, Ukrainian Women's Fund, and the work that we are doing at the local level supporting women and supporting women's movement. And I can also speak about uh, from, from the experience of the organization that is implementing a flagship project of Canadian government within feminist foreign assistance policy, which is Women's Voice and Leadership Project. We are one of the few women's funds, local women's funds that are direct implementers of this initiative. Um, so, um, well, when Sophia was was talking about the women in decision making, I was thinking about again back to my experience of being an IDP uh, when I stayed uh, in a small town uh, at the border with Poland while I went there on the first days of the war. And I, as a volunteer, I joined local um, humanitarian center, and the head of this center, of course, is a woman. Uh, she is, well, she was working really hard uh, and she is still working very hard getting, you know, humanitarian support to IDPs, to mostly women, of course, women and children who are in this um, little town called Truskavets. Uh, she is working with different humanitarian organizations and with the others. And, um, well, sometimes she's successful, sometimes she's not. But when, um, uh, when you go to the upper level, uh, to the uh, bigger humanitarian center, like oblast level, the regional, the big regional level humanitarian center, which is basically designing the policy, their rules and politics about distributing of humanitarian aid to which, what goes where, the head of this, uh, obviously, right, you are smiling, the head of this humanitarian center is a man. So how he could know how women are living in this small town Truskavets. And I think, well, this, you know, my personal experience with this, with this really is um, showing that the systems are not working properly because women are not there. How you can make a decision about, you know, women who are suffering from conflict-related sexual violence. And I don't know if you are following the news today, there are some developments in the south of Ukraine and uh, Ukrainian army, Ukrainian forces are now entering Kherson and I am already getting a lot of messages from our partners there that there will be huge number of cases of conflict-related sexual violence because Russia is using uh, this as a weapon in this, in this war. Um, so how can you develop the policy for women who are suffering in this war if you are not them, if you are not these women, if you are not talking to them? Um, this is something that we are trying, working on actually, not trying, but working on uh, at the Ukrainian Women's Fund. We are um, working at the local level because this is also something that we think is extremely important. Even if we have a wonderful policy on paper, it will never ever work if it's not implemented on the ground. And therefore, it, it is, I think, similar for, you know, small local policy or a national policy or even feminist foreign assistance policy. If it's not implemented properly, if it has all these nice and right words, but does, which don't, do not work on practice, then it will not be effective. So we are working with the women's groups, with women activists on the ground that, are, that know the solutions, but do not have yet the power and the voice uh, to bring these solutions to the level where decisions are made. Um, so we are doing three, this through um, uh, training of these women, empowering them, providing them the first grants as a grant making organization. We are brave enough to be the first donor for many women's organizations. Uh, and um, they are joining the movement, they are joining you know, the force now and becoming real advocates. And also what we do, we um, uh, make platforms for these organizations, for these women to come together with those who are making decisions at the local level, at the national level, uh, well, sometimes at the international level as well.
uh, and we try to make these tables where these decisions are discussed um, as comfortable as possible for those who are there, not only for those who are making decisions, but also for those who are offering the solutions. And we are doing this through the coalitions. We call them coalitions on, uh, well, in, in Ukraine, the, the whole um, uh, women, peace and security agenda, of course, is very relevant now. And we kind of, we, we understand that it has a very different meaning, a very practical meaning. So these coalitions, we organize them around 1325 agenda, uh, UN Women, Peace and Security Resolution, and they are working on uh, creating local policies that are for women and about women. And we hope that, you know, all these initiatives, and this is actually something that we are presenting in the booth number 34. <laughs> I remember the, the number, and we are also, I think, in this cluster of, um, of um, sister uh, booths. Um, so you are welcome to, to come join, and you know, I can, um, I and my colleague who is there, we can talk more about our work there. Natalia, thank you. And you know, it's such an important reminder as well that as much as the support that you're providing to the ground for women to be prepared and able to come and speak, but policymakers need to take the time to listen and they need to take the time. So if it means an extra day or two on a mission, you take the extra day. And if it means putting something else aside to do this, this is as or more important than many other things. And I think those priorities have to be central in these kinds of policies. So thank you. Um, so we want to move now to a few other sort of strategies and, and tools um, that can inspire us to think to think a little bit more. And so um, Eunice, if I may, I'd like to turn to you to talk a little bit um, from your perspective about um, women's roles in decision-making processes and how you sort of see feminist leadership in the work that you're doing. Uh, thank you. Um, it's a distinct honor to be here with you all and to share on a topic that is close to my heart. Um, so happy to be here. Uh, just listening to what has been spoken by previous speakers, just to say as a feminist organization, we try to go beyond the concept of gender and move towards feminism. Um, just really to recognize that um, beyond gender justice, there are other systems that reinforce um, oppression discrimination, uh, sexism, uh, capitalism, imperialism. So we do not look merely at uh, gender justice. We want to ensure that there's climate justice, there's social justice, and that means that you look, you apply an intersectional lens to the problems that we are facing. So really just taking us back to looking at the root causes uh, of women's oppression and women in all their diversities, really. So we try to create spaces where we can look for an alternative world, an alternative society, a society where women are respected and there's dignity. Of course, we recognize that that's a higher aspiration. So we hold the higher aspiration, but then think about building blocks to achieve that higher aspiration. Um, we're trying to also go beyond um, um, language and framing that has so far not been very useful. Uh, with all due respect, gender mainstreaming, it hasn't delivered anything for women. So we feel that is really um, whitewashing. It doesn't lead to any transformative change for women in all their diversities. So even if you did a toolkit that is going to support uh, in terms of gender mainstreaming, it's truly not going to lead to anything. Why? Because it doesn't really seek to address the root causes of the conditions that women are facing. So going beyond those concepts that um, sort of seem like band aid, uh, trying to assist the practical needs of women, but still leave women in, in a deeper crisis. The reason why we are here at the Paris Peace Forum is because we are facing multiple crises and maybe it's time to rethink our interventions, our strategies that have often been band aid. Um, so I'll just speak about 
akina mama wa Africa, what we seek to do as a Pan-African feminist organization. We have a feminist leadership development program that creates a safe space for women in all their diversities to come together and share their experiences, their lived realities, but then also as a rethink space where we try to think as much as possible of alternatives and then also as a bold, a bold space where we say what can we do uh, in the most safe way um, as African women. So it's curated as a space for experience sharing, for equipment and for exposure as well. Uh, the anchor of all this is really raising political consciousness and politicizing the agenda that we are working on towards a feminist future. We recognize, and I'll end on this point, that um, does not necessarily mean that you have a woman in leadership. I mean, we had apologies, Liz Truss in the UK. She's not a feminist. Uh, her agenda was not going to improve the lot of majority of African women. And so having women, more women in leadership will not necessarily lead to a better, a better future. And finally, as an African woman, uh, as an African woman seated here, it was quite, I was just smiling uh, in a cheeky and cheesy way thinking about the Paris Peace Forum when uh, France is responsible for majority of the war on Africa as the root cause. So I was like, this is such a bipolar situation. On one hand, you're giving and talking about peace. On the other hand, you're the instigator of coups, the recent coups on the African continent have really been instigated by the French or, yeah. So it's, it's the irony of life that we have to deal with. Thank you. Eunice, thank you. And thank you so much for really bringing up these questions also of power that this isn't just about ideas and nice concepts and words, but this really is about transforming and moving away from a status quo that has been, that has taken us into the crises that we're in and held people down in that, in that space. And, and, and the point of intersectionality, I think is also particularly critical. And I know one that um, feminist foreign policies have been criticized for um, and something that I think is so important to be, to be moving, um, moving towards as, as really central to all of those policies. And so I know if I, if I can now turn um, to you, Lyric. I know you've been working on um, the development of common framework around feminist foreign policy, and I think it would be interesting to hear that from that sort of wider, um, wider lens on, on your side. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm grateful to the organizers and um, truly humbled to be on a panel with these wonderful colleagues doing amazing work in various contexts. Um, I think this, the story I'll tell you before I tell you about the framework is how my organization, the International Center for Research on Women, came to this work, and then how the process of studying and increasingly shaping feminist foreign policy has um, taken us on a, on a journey together with many of the partners in, in this room and around this table. So we've been very interested in feminist foreign policy since 2014 when Sweden became the first country to announce. Um, but it's hard to do research on a sample of one, so we had to wait a few years. And then once we heard from Canada in 2017 on their feminist international assistance policy and heard announcements from Luxembourg in 2018 and Mexico and France in 2019 and 2020, we said, all right, this is now something that is moving. There are now, if you fast forward to today, 13 governments who have announced feminist foreign policies. The status of a couple of those are in question, including, tragically, Sweden and also Libya, and we have a, a, our Libyan partner here as well. Um, but we were very keen to have a, a common definition or some minimum standards so that we could um, respond to the question, the very legitimate question of, isn't this just pinkwashing? Isn't this just governments showing up at the UN on Women's Day and saying, our foreign policy is feminist now? And we say, oh, great, what changed? And they're like, nothing, it's just Women's Day. So it's, you know, Feminist Foreign Policy Day. 
Um, and so what, what we thought we were writing starting in 2018, and we were very keen in our methodology, which we were hoping to utilize as much of a feminist methodology as possible, to center the voices and perspectives of women who are on the receiving end of these policies um, as our first step before coming to government and before engaging with uh, officials in the handful of countries who had started to do this work um, under that name. And certainly acknowledging that there's a lot of amazing work being done, not called feminist foreign policy, but for the purpose of our study, we wanted to say, if you're calling it feminist, what does that mean? And take a look under the hood, identify common approaches, identify differences across contexts, and very importantly, center the voices of women human rights defenders around the world who are receiving end of these policies. So we did dozens of global consultations with hundreds of women's rights defenders and activists and academics around the world. And the number one, um, the number one term that we heard reflected in the course of those conversations was accountability. And the other one was intersectionality. So I'm grateful to Eunice for giving us an excellent um, view of what we mean by that. So I thought we were writing a paper. And once we had done these series of consultations and written our papers, we decided to convene the governments who had announced. Um, and uh, some of the core partners who had been really working to push this, this agenda on the civil society side. And what I found about the magic of that space in a Chatham House rule convening where feminists working inside governments and feminists working on the outside were very aligned in their vision and the kind of transformative and principle-based future that we want to imagine together, despite coming from very different sectoral or geographic contexts, was the WhatsApp group went wild. People didn't care about the paper. I mean, the paper is an important contribution, and that's the framework, and it's available in English, Spanish, French, German, Dutch, and Arabic at booth 35 downstairs among a number of our partners. Um, but what was really important was a, a space for um, a trust-based engagement for feminists inside governments who really do want to be the bureaucrat bureaucratic innovators who are dismantling the way these structures have been um, created and, and um, sustained over years in a manner that does attempt to disrupt patriarchal norms and homophobic norms and colonial norms and all of the isms that we see manifesting in the multi-crisis. And so the space that we have been now organizing in our solution downstairs is a network. It's called the Global Partner Network for Feminist Foreign Policy. And it is a space um, for learning and exchange around an assumption that we're all trying to do good work together, that we are encountering enormous challenges within our own institutions, within our own policy frameworks, certainly within the geopolitical order that we find ourselves in today. Um, but if we're not in conversation with each other and if we're not trying to co-create a better way, there isn't a way forward. So please come see us at the booth. We'd love to be in dialogue with you. And we look very much forward to hearing about the great work of our other partners, several of whom are around the table um, today. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm going to turn to um, our last um, our last speaker, Anisha, and you've all been phenomenally, phenomenally disciplined, which means that we will have lots of time. I know there's lots of people around the table who will want um, to speak to a few things. I um, was really fortunate to be um, in Colombia a couple of times this year and have been really inspired by the women's social movements there who have led to, as many of you will have seen, a really phenomenal leadership change there and a really different environment in, um, in leadership that's going on right there. Right then, and I know Anisha, you've been doing some work on women's social movements, and so would be really interested to hear your thoughts um, on how women's social movements are, are contributing to this, and also what the global south can be teaching the global north about what needs to be done better there. Okay. <laughs> All of them. <laughs> All right, I'm going. To, uh... um, thank you so much. Um, really, uh, you know. Uh, happy to be here 
And um, just a quick introduction about myself. I am Anisha Chug. I am the executive director of Women's Fund Asia, which is a feminist fund which supports um, human rights of women, girls, trans, and intersex and gender non-conforming people uh, in 18 plus countries in the Asia region. And I represent the AIR consortium, which is Amplify Invest Reach Consortium, which is made up of Women's Fund Fiji, Urgent Action Fund for Women, Human Rights, Asia and the Pacific, and the Pacific Feminist Fund, along with uh, Australian DFAT. And uh, a unique thing about this partnership is because it's one of the first direct partnerships of Australian DFAT with women's funds based in the Global South. Um, and um, Merida, just taking up on the question around the important work of um, women's rights movements, social movements, uh, feminist movements. Um, I think one thing to note to me that comes to mind is the disability rights movement slogan, nothing about us without us. And uh, those who face multiple levels of marginalization and discrimination are the best place to fight that marginalization and discrimination. Um, and that's what the women's, the feminist movements in the region have been doing. Uh, we've looked at, we work with communities, constituencies who face multiple levels of marginalization, discrimination, vulnerabilities on an everyday basis. We are living in a context where we are re-looking at crisis mode. Crisis is not like a short period uh, event that is now occurring. We're looking at larger impact of such crisis, constituencies living every day in crisis, and what does, how does that impact bodies of individuals who are also criminalized in their own context, especially when you look at LGBTIQ communities, sex workers, where do they stand? Where are they placed? And what we have noticed and what we have seen over the last um, 20 years at least, that these movements, these constituencies have been at the forefront of not only fighting anti-gender movements and holding the ground, but like Uni said, at, uh, when you're looking at peace and conflict, when you're looking at climate justice, um, environmental justice, it's the indigenous women who are leading the agenda, but they're nowhere at the table. So what are we doing to ensure that the voices get to the table? The fact that the policies are centered around the voices and experience of those who face that level of discrimination. And, um, you know, one of, there was this recent, um, so in 2013, there was a study by Weldon and uh, Tan, I think I'm pronouncing the name right, uh, which was updated in 2020, which did this mapping of 75 countries over a period of three decades. And um, they looked at what was the significant, most important impact on policies around violence against women. And it was the feminist movements. They were the ones who led that change, who brought about that policy movements, not politicians, <laughs> um, not women representatives, but the movements themselves. And it is so important that these movements be resourced in the current context because they're also historically the most under-resourced. Uh, when we look at the data, um, it was, I think, in 2017 and 2018, the AWID and Candida data, which said that 1% of private foundations' philanthropy as well as 1% of international uh, aid around gender justice goes directly to women's rights organizations. And that's appalling. 1%, and if you look at our regions, Latin America, Africa, Asia, and the Pacific, the, <coughs> the number dwindles even further. Um, so where exactly are these policies? Who is making these policies? Where is the representation of the voice, right? Um, because the key is direct partnerships. Uh, how can we directly go and have partnerships with Southern-based feminist organizations? Um, one of the, uh, you know, I mean, I don't want to get, go into what can Global South teach the Global North. Um, I do think that when we're looking at feminist foreign policy, uh, the, the way the aid structure is created, uh, the way resources are flowing, um, I think directly resourcing feminist movements is key to that in the Global South. Why? Mainly because it is the obligation of the government and the state of the global, various states of the global north, looking at the context of colonialization, imperialism, it is reparations. 
the fact that the wealth in these regions continues to be generated on the exploitation of the communities in the global south. Look at the way trade deals are being um, negotiated or the whole global supply chain. Where are the, uh, the workers or the ones who are creating our iPhones? And where is then the profit going back to? And who is it going back to? So I think it is this larger context. And resourcing feminist movements in the global south has that direct impact in the global north as well, looking at the organizing, having very critical discussions right now around global majority. Right? What does it mean? How, how is issue around racism, uh, ethnicity, eth uh, discrimination around ethnicity being addressed in the global north now that we have refugee crisis around the world? We have climate refugees, we have political refugees. So I think the, the binaries between global south and east and global north is also blurring. How are we having those discussions around? What is the impact? Um, is something that we really, really need to think about in the spe especially in the coming few years, given the backlash that there is um, around feminist movements, uh, the kind of anti-gender movements that are going on. Um, I mean, look at the US, right? So I think those are the kind of conversations we really need to be having when we are looking at feminist foreign policy. Thank you. Anisha, thank you so much for that. We have 20 minutes and six seconds left. Um, any of you who are um, around the table who would like to speak, if you wouldn't mind putting your card up if you have it. If not, um, just wave at me and I will try to make sure that I, that I catch you. Um, I would really love it if, if we could also just be thinking a little bit in, in some of the comments. I'd love to hear reactions from, from this really, really rich set of, of uh, presentations so far, but also to really think about who else do we need to be bringing into this? What, what needs to change? I mean, if we are talking about status quo, if we are talking about power and about bringing policymakers to not just listen, but to listen and do and do differently, who else do we need to be bringing into this conversation and how do we, how do we begin to do that? So I am opening it up to, um, to the table. You all look incredibly thoughtful. Caitlin, excellent. Kick gonna, us off. Yeah, I'm going to say, but what maybe, what do we need to be bringing to the table? So I'm just going to throw something in because I've been on two AI panels earlier um, today. And I think it's the tools. In order to change the power dynamic, feminists who analyze power dynamics need to understand, understand that tool making is part of this decision making and they need to take control of the cre design, creation, and deployment of all these new tools and all this emerging technology. We have found in our work um, that feminist groups are a little bit disconnected from this idea. They're not particularly interested. We don't know why. Technologists, of course, are not traditionally very interested in gender themselves. So we find ourselves in a very empty part of a Venn diagram. And what I want to say is, like, if you design a shoe, um, you would draw it and you would take it to a shoemaker. You would probably never occurred to you that you would have to go to shoemaking school. You'd have to learn to tan leather. You'd have to learn how to hammer the nail into the shoe. But the shoemaker might have a conversation with you about ergonomics or how it would work. Technologists build things that other people design. And it's too important to leave technology to the technologist. So I would beg us as feminists to not only look at quantities of women around the table, but also the qualitative part of it, which is the, actually having feminists there, but also feminist ideology and design in this new century that we're embarking on. Thanks. It's fascinating. I have a, um, a, fr a friend and colleague in, uh, in Canada who's doing her PhD thesis on developing an indigenous feminist algorithm online and really looking at what it would mean to actually build an algorithm that's entirely designed on indigenous knowledge. And again, it's about taking control of the content as well of some of these tools. I, just, just really quickly for the next thing for our Feminist AI Research Network, our next call for proposals, which will be open to people in LAC, MENA, and Southeast Asia, will be looking at automated decision making. So that's any social protection program that you have, whether it's university places or conditional cash transfers or pensions, but to what to reimagine what that allocation might be. Uh, the technology is really in, easy, and then to work with uh, municipalities to actually implement. Thanks. Caitlin. Alexandre. Yeah, thank you, Meredith. Um, can I say that I'm very happy to sit at this table? 
it looks very different from the ones I usually sit at. Um, if this is the future, great. Um, I wanted to come back on something that was mentioned in several of, by several of the speakers, this idea of creating a safe network or of a safe space, which is also then uh, a better tool for visibility. And I think this is probably, I mean, you, you, obviously any, any kind of discrimination or fight against discrimination needs allies of all kinds. And uh, currently I have the feeling, and if I look back the last two, three years I've spent in New York, the United Nations, for instance, which was quite different from the understanding I had when I was coming from Europe, from the European Union, where, okay, it was a talk about gender equality, etc. But it never really went that much into the proactivity of things. It's changing there too. But uh, at the UN, also maybe because of the presence of the Global South, there's a much bigger awareness. Now, we are still in an exercise of ticking the box, very politically correct, but you can't be any longer a leader or a male leader in foreign policy uh, or elsewhere uh, if you don't take that consideration, uh, I mean, take that into consideration. So I would say the door is open. It's the moment to jump in. I've, saw, I've seen some initiatives. They can't be very benign initiatives, but for instance, more and more member states have female ambassadors in New York. Why? I mean, first of all, because they're competent and good, but also because there's, um, they've come to uh, an awareness that if you want to be a co-facilitator on a file, because for the optics, that's the good result of the quotas, uh, you will be selected as a country and as a co-facilitator if you're a woman, because there's always a global north and a global south. That's something which has been going on for 10, 20, 30 years always, because it's that kind of balance. But now the gender balance has come on top of that. You need one male, one female, whether from the north or from the south. How do you do if you have 80% male ambassadors? Uh, where do you find that second woman? So this is kind of an evolution that has been changing. And I think there is a, a reappropriation of something. It's not necessary to reinvent. I mean, women have always been there. When I'm, when I'm talking to some of these female ambassadors, they say, oh, you're the, the woman in action. What can you tell to the next generation? I said, I'm not the first one. My, grand, my mothers and my grandmothers, our, grand, our mothers and grandmothers were already there, but they decided, they chose to remain anonymous. So it's not that it is something new. It is about more visibility. And there was a, a funny initiative, for instance, when I call about this reappropriation. Uh, for the 75th anniversary of the United Nations, uh, there was an initiative by female ambassadors to uh, have to re-sign and recommit to the principles of the UN Charter. So when we talk about uh, peace and security and, and big uh, hardcore issues, the idea was we as women ambassadors, we're going to put this forward, we're going to sign this in the hem cycle of the General Assembly, and this is an initiative by women ambassadors to do something which is now different from what it was 75 years ago, where all those who signed the UN Charter by then, with a few exceptions, were men, for instance. So there are those kind of, of little initiatives, I would say, go, go again, for, for that kind of visibility, because the context is favorable to that. And um, I mean, there is some sort of positive reception uh, to go ahead with those things. I have a couple of hands. I apologize if I don't know your name. So I'm just going to point at you, which feels really, really rude. So here, and then I'll come to you, please. Um, if you can um, share uh, liberally the microphones, we would appreciate it, because it is being recorded. Thanks. There you go. No, okay. Yes, my name is Victoria Perotti, and uh, I'm a consultant with um, different organizations, among them the, the European Commission International Partnerships. And, uh, and to answer your question, who should be here, I think it's actually <laughs> that international partnerships of, of the, the Commission, the donor community. Because uh, one of the issues that was mentioned by Anisha uh, was exactly that, that there is um, an issue with how international cooperation is done and how that money reaches really the civil society from the global south. Um, and uh, yeah, I would like to, to talk afterwards a little bit more with you and um, think together how this, this can be improved. There is some things from the commission that I think would be very interesting for you. Uh, and the other thing I just wanted to mention is that it saddens me, actually, uh, when I'm in this table. One, one thing, but normally when, when I'm among this uh, amazing group of women, you feel so stimulated and full of ideas and re-energized. But what saddens me is that it, there is, what, three men 
maybe behind, I don't know. I, I see one in the table. And this is something that for me, uh, foreign, sweet, well, the foreign, feminist foreign policy, it's about men and women. And we should have men in the table um, participating, but maybe also in the panel, uh, real allies that, that we can find in, um, in this kind of policy. Thank you. Thanks. Um, can we invite our friend here to the table just to make sure that you can reach the microphone? Great, thanks. Hi. Oh, sorry. Uh, my name is Geethi. I uh, represent the German Development Cooperation here. Uh, it is really encouraging for me to see the energy in this room and more such rooms like these. Uh, but at the same time, when we go back to the for feminist foreign development policy, I wonder how we deal with the backlash sometimes with the term feminism because it is happening. Uh, we advise next year the German foreign minister, uh, the German minister, basically on the new feminist foreign policy and. Um, I believe that the advocacy behind it, the language of it, uh, and how we speak about it going forward is going to be defined by the politics of it and the domestic politics of it. So maybe like an open question here that how do you, how do you balance? And then when, when we go back to the same loop of this policy not being able to do anything because of just so much backlash and it would just be like a paper sitting and not really having anything uh, material to it. I'm struck. I was listening. I was reading a paper in advance of this on um, on German foreign policy, and, and it was an argument for not a feminist but a fair foreign policy. And what was interesting to me was a lot of the things that were in described as the fair foreign policy were exactly what Eunice just said. So there really was it, it's the same pieces but with a different label, which was interesting to me. So I think I have two. You had your hand up. Yes, and then over here and others. Okay, and I've got two more. Oh. So I've got, I've got about five people, we've got nine minutes, so I'm gonna try and get everyone in, but I'll run um, across, zigzagging across the table and then to the back, go ahead. Okay, well, I just wanted to return to the question about the, the missing contributions, let's say. Um, so my name is Satara Nath. I represent the Center for Migration, Gender and Justice based in Stuttgart. And I guess as the name would suggest, we work kind of in the nexus of migration and gender. Um, so, so for me, um, as a migrant woman and also coming from a migrant women youth-led organization, I would submit that particularly migrant women are, are people who are particularly excluded from the political sphere in general. And I imagine um, nece necessarily that that extends to foreign policy as well. Um, and so our organization works with women, girls, LGBTQIA+, and gender diverse migrants um, to kind of shrink the spaces between governing bodies and migrant communities. And basically our commitment, and I think this ties very nicely to the topic of intersectionality, is um, basically gender justice beyond borders. And I think, um, yeah, I think when it comes to solutions, um, this is a very difficult issue to, 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 to tackle because um, migrant women you know, come into a new political space and I think becoming familiarized with a whole new set of, you know, institutions and governing structures and policy and political spaces, that, that's an immense challenge already. And so kind of stepping into the sphere, I can imagine it is so difficult as a migrant woman myself, stepping into political advocacy in general in the EU has been ex extraordinarily challenging. Um, so I just want to speak to that and to say that I think one incredible way that we can kind of move forward in this, in this respect is to offer more empowerment empowering opportunities. Um, and in particular, I'm thinking of a program that we run, which is a migrant youth leadership program, where we basically train migrant youth all over the European Union um, get to get involved with politics at the EU level. Um, and so I just want to speak to that and to, to, to emphasize, I think that this is a particularly important contribution that's missing at the table, not necessarily here, but at the, at the metaphorical table of foreign policy. So yeah. Great. Thank you. Thank you. And over to you. Yeah, I'm Hiba Osman and I represent Karama. Um, this was a very interesting discussion, actually. Uh, we didn't go deep into the, you know, what feminist foreign policy is, because it's loaded and it's not simple, you know? It does not have really a sim It's very political, especially for us. So uh, who is missing? I don't want to go into too many things. Who is missing? The women who are affected by deranged, you know, foreign policy. These are the women who are pissing. A Yemeni woman should be here talking about the situation and how France or England or all these, you know, European policies toward, you know, these countries, how it's affecting her. 
and, if, uh, and how it's affecting the women in those countries and what can France do. These are the discussions that we should be having. But I think women are born polite and they will end up always polite. These are the things I don't want to hear 101 of what a feminist is or what. I want to talk as a woman about the real policies that are affecting me and how can we change that. So, you know, that's, uh, that's it. Until then, we are just going to say more women this and more women that. It doesn't make any sense. Where's power? And how are we going to affect it? So until we are serious about these things and going deep into, you know, into this, we are not, we're not going to do anything. We're still going to talk, and next year we'll be talking about the same thing. The last thing is uh, the Paris um, uh, Peace Forum should absolutely, if it's a peace forum, we need to bring those women who are affected by these strange foreign policies. It's very important. I would like to see more black women and more Asian women and more, you know, you know, that's, uh, there's no equality. So don't talk to me about gender equality or equality of us. And I think a note for next year and that they should be on the main stage as well. Yeah. Hilda. <laughs> Hilda. Thank you very much. I can be very short. I think Natalia, Lyric, Ambika, uh, Anisha, their stories showed us that it really does matter um, that you have women and men in positions with power. Um, I look to the European Commission. I'm one of the directors general of the European Commission. The European Commission set itself a number of years ago the objective of achieving parity. We're near there. And I can tell you that the discussions in that group of people have become very different and men and women recognize that. And now this is no longer a topic about which we need to talk so much. So in short, it does matter to set the objective that you strive for parity because it helps achieving it. If you don't make it explicit, uh, you don't get there. Thank you. And I think, um, thank you, Hilda, and I think to, to follow on, Heba, from your point as well, that that parity has to be about women who are directly affected by conflict, not only in these other spaces, and we have to really lean into that intersectionality when we think about what that parity means, particularly in spaces like this. So um, can I invite you to, Hilda, do you mind maybe turning your microphone back on and we can ask her to... I, I'm good. I, I are you sure? I have a background so I can project. Okay, um, but it's being, it's being recorded. So just for our, so friends who are listening to the... Um, listening to the, to the Talk. Thank you. I sit half on this chair and half on that. <laughs> we make room for ourselves. Uh, it's all about sharing. Thank you. I particularly really loved your intervention. My name is Harbin. I'm the founder of a group called G100. Somebody spoke about a psychological safe space and being visible. I, I thought that was... I think our brother spoke about that. And you spoke so much about including really the women at, um, at every level. So we have horizontal verticals. The idea is very briefly G100 because we're not waiting 100 years for gender equality. We say, what can we do? Of course, we advocate for policy, but we are also actors. So we said, okay, brought around 100 women from different countries. Uh, we have a Nobel Peace Laureate who's on our group who's here today. Uh, I would have loved her to come in, but yeah. Okay, it's a small intervention, but just my small intervention is we are doing 100 consultations across the world. This is our 26th consultation. This is our 26th meeting. We were here uh, yesterday. We had uh, 55 women, again, from 20 countries who came in. Segolin Royal is on our group. Uh, Elizabeth Marino, former minister, is on our group. And these, they are, uh, you know, leading 100 different verticals, and they nominate. It's a blueprint of 100, 100, 100, leading to a million gender champions. And we have a denim club which is a he for she club, which is not just ticking the box and uh, is actually getting men to support, but it's hard. It's, it's, it's not easy. It's hard. So what we have been doing for the past 10 years, this is the fifth platform, is uh, we have this band, which is a bond of sisterhood and now a bond of solidarity. Because what is missing really is the trust and togetherness. There's a lot of othering. There's a lot of us and them, whether it's based on gender, whether it's based on color, east, west, north, south. There is this othering. The, I think the uh, director of the World Food Program in the morning spoke about what if we could just respect our neighbor as our equal. And I think that's so fundamental to doing that. Uh, I come from India. 
and we always uh, try to take everything to the level of the soul. And when we do namaste, we say, my soul bows to the soul in you, which means I don't see the body consciousness. I don't see your color. I don't see your gender. But we do see because we are human beings, right? But it's, it's a personal practice to develop that peace mindset. Uh, we heard this yesterday in our meetings, and I think this peace mindset begins with a sense of equality and an equal respect, and uh, just breaking down all those barriers of what terminology we might be using, depoliticize the discourse, and bring it to the human and the heart-centered level. And if we just do that, it's simple. That's really been our learning. So I just wanted to put that little humanizing, heart-centered perspective. And I had the opportunity to meet uh, Minister Anne Linde. We were hosted uh, in Sweden at the Swedish Parliament uh, for our meetings over there. So it's, an, it's, it's lovely to be able to listen to the Swedish feminist foreign policy being discussed on these tables as well. I thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. I, we have one minute exactly and one more speaker. So you have 60 seconds. Sure. No I, pressure. I, thank you so much, uh, Sarah from UN Women. Actually, it's just questions that I had, if that's okay. <laughs> I realize maybe there's not time for dialogue. Um, but, you know, as the constellation of countries interested in being intentional about building a feminist foreign policy expands. So with a list of countries that have already raised their hand and said we're in, and now we hear, you know, following in the footsteps of Colombia and of Mexico, Liberia, following in the footsteps of uh, Canada and Sweden, Netherlands and Germany. So as those countries expand, what is your recommendation around how the nomenclature of a feminist foreign policy and what's under there can remain central. Things such as power, transformation, collective accountability, inclusion, uh, intersectionality. What's that pathway for, for these new, new entrants, as it were? And my second question is, we've also heard about how a whole of government approach is important. Um, that feminist foreign policy should touch areas of trade, finance, security, and military. Of course, foreign affairs, but also migration, asylum, climate. What are the pathways to ensure that feminist foreign policy really does have that breadth of reach as a whole of government approach? We'd love to hear. Thanks. Thanks, Sarah. You've just set up the next hour, which we're all going to have to do over coffee downstairs in front of all of the amazing booths. And I think just to finally say, I think this point about transformation is so important because it's uncomfortable. Transformation isn't easy because it requires seeding ground. It requires changing power structures. It requires a lot of discomfort for people who are already leaning in as well as people who haven't lent in yet. And I think that that's really at the core of what has to happen is people have to be willing to be uncomfortable and do things genuinely, genuinely differently. Um, so it just leaves it to me to say just the hugest thank you. Merci. Shukran. Chimigwech. Santani Sana. Thank you. Thank you to everyone around the table for just such an extraordinary extraordinary, extraordinary discussion. I hope this is to be continued. And next time, all of the heads of state who are here are going to have to be in this room listening to all of you. Thank you.